Yeah, I was drawing as far as I remember that certain conceptualization or the illustration of a certain conceptualization of history by Hegel in the form of a history of the development of the Geists. We had started with uh, material nature and proceeded from there, okay, with the appearance. All these actually primarily taking place in the constitution of the spirit itself, nowhere else. The whole existence is the totality of the spirit, nothing else, okay? So what you, what you see is material nature is the expression of spirit in a definite form and nothing else, okay? Now, out of this material nature, the appearance of uh, sense certainty, of course, reflects a stage in the separation of the spirit in its own self, okay? Self certain, sense certainty sets the initial movement towards the separation of the internal and external, okay? The self and the other, be myself and the surrounding world, if you like, okay? Which is followed by the appearance of perception and followed by understanding. We have said that with the appearance of understanding, spirit arrives at the stage of consciousness, okay? Now, consciousness means uh, actually the appearance of the human in the history as well, okay? And human taking the world through its consciousness, taking the world before itself as it is object. But the moment of spirit does not stop here. And we were talking about the formation or rise of the self-consciousness. Yeah. Through the process of a dialectic of, or master-slave dialectic, or servant dialectic. We have seen as well how spirit overcomes this, okay? This implies actually, this is an interesting moment. This points to the moment of the formation of the society, okay? Formation of, or perhaps not the formation of the society, but entering the, of the society into consciousness, okay? If you like, social consciousness begins to develop from that point on at the same time, okay? so. The unity had been divided into two. The unity of consciousness as well had been divided into two, okay? And uh, one part constituted of the master, while the other part uh, uh, was the servant, okay? And we have talked about how in master's case consciousness develops while at the same time losing its connections or ties with life itself, okay? And in a contrary fashion, uh, how the consciousness on the part of the servant fades away, weakens, while the servant serves the uh, works for the fulfillment of the services of the master. Okay? So the labor of the servant, establishing connections with the life of the whole, while the consciousness of the master, okay, uh, where the culture develops, booms, okay. Now, we also said that this creates a problem of recognition on the part of the uh, master's consciousness. And this problem of recognition turns the masters of master's consciousness into being an unhappy consciousness, okay. Master cannot be happy, cannot feel satisfied by the recognition he or she can get from the servant. And therefore, 
in its quest for recognition, valuable recognition, satisfying re recognition, tries to elevate the status of the slave by supplying the slave with the rights of the modern society, okay, to a more or less equal position. So only equals uh, can give satisfactory recognition towards each other, okay? So with this, with this establishment of uh, recognition, actually, this has been written down at about 1807, okay? That book, Phenomenology of this of Spirit, okay, is published in 1807, okay, at the, right at the beginning of the 19th century. But you will see uh, some of the points developed here in this book are still uh, quite a popular currency in our contemporary discussions and uh, thought. Okay, for instance, the discussions uh, pertaining to the possibility of democracy as well as pertaining to the mm, newly developing post-metaphysical, uh, or if you like, post-secular society, etc., had already been there developed, okay? Uh, we have seen that, actually, you know, mutual recognition among equals. Let's take a look at it. among, if not absolutely, but approximately equals. Allowing them to unite, if not perfect in, our, in perfect harmony, to unite in society. Okay? Therefore, I have told that you that after that stage, okay, what emerges in the structure of consciousness is reason. Corresponding, in, if you like, finding its correspondent entity in the material history in the form of society. I guess last time I have left our discussion here. We have arrived at the society, okay? And I, I was telling you how we should understand this society, okay? Uh, we shouldn't understand that society as a dependent entity, okay? Dependent entity, dependent on the existence of its members, okay? No, it's rather on the contrary, as I said. The existence of the individual members all their existence to the existence of the society, okay? That the society is there, we are going to begin to talk about the appearance of the individual, okay? So individual is not a given entity, but it's an emergent entity in its contradistinction or relation with the society representing the whole. Now, there are interesting arguments, however, though, we have arrived at somehow harmonious unity of society. We will see how I can evaluate this difficult, perhaps, relationship between the individual and society. You know, there were many people blaming Hegel for sacrificing individual to the benefit of the society, etc. Okay? For instance, I remember a Karl Raymond Popper in his book, uh, what was the title of the book? Open Society and Its Enemies. Okay? especially in its second volume, he criticized both Hegel and Marx uh, by saying that they were ready to sacrifice the individual, individual freedoms, etc. Actually, yeah, that may be an interesting point of discussion. The society emerged as the primal entity, no longer the individual here, okay? Uh, human being. Yes, even this self-consciousness, as we have seen, this is an interesting point. Up until now, we were talking about an abstract consciousness, okay? Thought to be existing to this or that degree in every individual member of the human species, okay? But interestingly now, what you will see here, here, at the stage of self-consciousness, 
where the master and servant dialect operates, okay, the interesting point is that what we are talking about there is self-consciousness is not the individual self-consciousness, as you can see, okay? And as you can appreciate, Marx will make use of this interesting point, okay? Actually, this is a division of the whole into different groups within that whole. And we are, as we are talking about the self-consciousness, that self-consciousness pertaining to these groups, belonging to these groups, no longer an abstract human species or no longer an actual individual member of a certain species, but a certain group already there in the picture. Okay? From then, uh, that point on, Marx, as you know, would develop his conception of class consciousness. Okay? Fine. However, here the path Hegel takes was rather quite different from the path Marx took, and therefore we arrived at a more or less harmonious society. Okay? And now we are going to analyze, we are going to go to an analysis of this society, what it is, what basic components it is constituted. But before that, okay, not before that, after that, okay, it can only, before that, we can a little bit talk about reason. Why reason rather than consciousness? Okay. As you may remember, in the Kantian uh, illustration, reason did constitute the highest faculty, if you like, within the structure of consciousness. Okay. And if, uh, let's put them in a hierarchy, okay. If we put a sensibility, the lowest faculty, corresponding roughly to the Hegelian conception of sense certainty, you know, the lowest faculty. Now, these are not narrated in a rather evolutionary fashion, okay, or developmental fashion. There, they have been handled in a historical fashion. Okay, sensibility, then understanding and imagination. And reason, at the apex of the hierarchy, we did find reason. And we know that actually in Kantian framework, the basic function of reason was to establish the unity. Okay? It had three ideas capable of transferring themselves into being ideals okay? through human activity. Okay? But as such, as ideas, they were performing a unifying function within the structure of consciousness. Okay. Now the interesting point again was this, that that unifying function cannot be supported by any possible experience. Therefore, I've told you that actually these three ideas were nothing else than three, three leaps of faith. Okay, so rational thinking, in other words, okay, to put it in other words, we can say that rational thinking is based upon these three leaps of faith. Without these leaps, you cannot claim to think rationally, you cannot claim to have any knowledge, etc. Okay, so you have to presuppose that the understanding entity consciousness here constitutes a unity, making it the unity of the subject. The understood object constitutes a unity, the unity of the object, and both of them together constitute the unity of the world. Okay? So, faith. Therefore, the principle of the unity of society here, or reason here, okay, is based upon faith. That's why we begin to talk about nowadays uh, the passage to the uh, post secular post-metaphysical society. Okay? Let me explain this. Beneath this story of the uh, history or development of the spirit, there is also another story okay, corresponding to this, another story of development. Okay? If for our case here, uh, we can trace that history under this, in the section entitled Enlightenment. 
in the book, Phenomenology of the Spirit. Now, this is a very interesting analysis of the enlightenment process, okay? Hegel says that, actually roughly corresponding to the rise of the understanding here, okay? Roughly corresponding to the rise of the understanding and extending itself to the stage of self-consciousness, okay? Now, the unity of this time, this is not the unity of consciousness, but the unity of the Geist, okay? The unity of the Geist is based upon faith, okay? And nothing else, simply because, as we have seen in the discussions of the Kantian philosophy, such a unity cannot be based upon any empirical experience, which means that such a presupposition cannot be translated into the language of knowledge. Okay? Therefore, it remains as a fact. Okay? The unity of society turns out to be based upon faith. The unity of consciousness is based upon faith. Hegel takes this idea, okay? but what we see throughout this process, okay, culminating in understanding and formation of consciousness, is the emergent split in the unity of that Geist. Okay? Hegel explains this as the insidious penetration of, of the pure insight Reine Ansicht, okay, into the structure of the facts, okay. Actually, even today in Turkey, we can witness the process, this same process, but throughout the Enlightenment time, times, actually, what happened that suddenly there emerged those so-called secular thinkers, okay? opposing themselves and their ideas against the dogma of the church. Okay? First of all, let me say this. None of the enlightened, only very few exceptions, the overwhelming majority of enlightenment thinkers were not against faith. Okay? Rather, on the contrary, what they were trying to do, take a look at Voltaire, for instance, his writings, okay? what they were trying to do, okay? was to save the true faith, rational faith, as they, they conceive it, okay, from the superstitious dogma of the church, which was rational. For instance, selling plots of land in the afterworld, etc. Okay? <laughs> Fine. So that they were not against faith. And their origins, actually, and most of the intellectuals were theology-educated people. So it was within the religious discussions this pure insight began to develop, okay, nowhere else, okay. It was within the religious circles this pure insight began to develop. Or if you like, rational thinking began to develop within the religious circles themselves. And Descartes, for instance, was a religious man. Others, well, as well, they too were religious men. Walter, religious men, etc., okay. So, he describes this process as the insidious. Insidious without making its coming manifest. Okay? Insidious penetration of pure insight into the structure of faith. Okay? And after a while, okay, it begins to differentiate itself from faith. Okay? And it opposes itself, later on, opposes itself in contradistinction to faith. Okay, this results in, the, in a split of the unity of the spirit. Okay? On the one hand, we would have the unity of consciousness or spirit, no longer consciousness here. Let me try to show you something like this. It starts from here, penetrates, penetrates, and acquires a superiority upper hand. Okay? and poses itself against faith, okay, 
But however, at the same time, it divides or destroys the unity of consciousness or Geist. Meanwhile, this unity is still kept. Okay, it has not been completely and absolutely destroyed, and the separation is inside that unity. Okay. It is something like the division of the unity of the society into two antagonistic classes, for instance. Okay, okay, we can still talk about two antagonistically related classes, existence of these two classes in, however, a society. A here means that unity we are talking about here as society is still integrated with in its own self. Okay. It has not been, the unity of the society has not been destroyed. The division is inside that unit. Okay? So, actually, faith while laying the grounds of the possibility of unity of the whole, on the one hand, okay, while at the same time, on the other hand, pure insight or pure rational thinking, if you like, okay, penetrate and get the superiority within the unity of the whole and pose itself against or in contradistinction to faith, dividing the totality into two, okay, splitting the totality. Now, what happens here? Okay? This actually is the appearance of the uh, self-consciousness. Okay? It is true with, through an encounter with the other here, what happens is exactly this, okay? Pure insight, encountering and struggling against the other, faith, okay? Establish its own self-identity, self-consciousness, if you like. While at the same time, faith being forced to engage in a struggle against pure insight itself, okay? Establish its own self-identity on the other hand, okay? So, they acquire a kind of historical determination which is characterized by their opposition against each other. Okay? Fine. So, here we begin to talk about the struggle of secularism, etc. Well, however, the interesting point is that, and Marx and others will make use of this point, okay? Since in the current situation, neither of the opposing parties now having access to the totality as a unity, okay, their point of views, or if you like, the point of views of their developed self-consciousness become biased, or if you like, partial, okay? So, this means that pure insight wants to see and evaluate the totality from its own point of view, okay? Why pure faith? wants to do the same from its own point of view, okay? But neither of these viewpoints can no longer represent the truth of the whole, okay? So therefore, Hegel would tell us that these developed self-consciousnesses, okay, respective self-consciousnesses, are unavoidably biased, okay? And not capable of representing and expressing the truth of the totality. Okay, the society is divided. Now, this is what happens in the unity of the master-servant dialectic, and we are about to enter into the society, okay? <laughs> now, in the society, the reconciliation between these two opposing forces. In the first case, the master and servant. In the second case, Faith and pure rational thinking or pure insight, Hegel would call it, okay? The reconciliation of these are expected according to the Hegelian dialectic of the development of the spirit by overcoming their differences, okay? However, the interesting point is that such a unity can only be achieved again on the ground of faith. Why? Because unity itself is based upon faith, okay? But this time, neither of the parties would try to reject the other and establish themselves as the parts of an harmoniously functioning whole, okay? 
This would become later on what we would begin to discuss as the post-metaphysical or post-secular society, okay? <laughs> Pure rational thinking finding its own proper and appropriate place within the structure of the totality of the society or totality of the spread, which should necessarily be based upon faith, simply because the totality cannot be supplied or grounded upon anything else. Okay? Now, take a look at the society section. This is what happens in reason, okay? Reason's uh, development when Geist arrives at the stage of the reason. On the other hand, let's take a look at what going on in the society, simply because this is no longer an imaginary society, but this is the modern society proper. Okay. The society makes its first appearance in the form of family, according to it. Okay. He describes family as the natural society, actually, okay, where the affectionate relationships, of course, as you can imagine, among the members uh, prevail. Okay. But with the extension of the family, what we, we arrive at what we call, misleadingly actually today, okay, uh, civil society, The, however, Hegelian conception of civil society is quite different from other our contemporary conceptualizations, simply because in our contemporary conceptualizations, what do we think of civil society? Is there anybody who likes to share his or her views about what a civil society is? What a civil society is? How we understand, what we understand by the term today. You know, it doesn't have decision-making power, but it affects decision-makers. Make yeah. So our understanding of civil society is nothing else than NGOs. Actually, in English, they are called non-governmental organizations. Right? Any other contribution? Anybody else? No. Okay. Actually, properly, our friend has told us what we usually come to understand by the term. Actually, this is partially due to the mistranslation into Turkish of these NGOs, non-governmental organization, organizations, as civil toplum kuruluşları. Okay. However, it has nothing to do with it. Okay. Civil society in the Hegelian sense is a society constituted of families and rivaling, sometimes struggling, waging war against each other families. Okay? Civil society is not a place for peace and tranquility. Okay? Rather, civil society is the place of conflict and struggle. Okay? So, contrary to our conceptualization of NGOs, okay, they are not the guarantee of peace, but rather they are the ground of struggle within society. Okay? They are the very ground where unequal struggles waged against each other by the parties, respective involved parties. Families against families, if you like. Okay? <laughs> or groups of families against other groups of families struggling against each other, constituting groups, etc., etc. Okay? This is the civil society. Okay? Then, out of this civil society, with its law, there emerges, of course, the state. So, the state cannot never be thought in the Hegelian framework as something against or opposed to the civil society, but rather it is the product of the civil society 
Now, as a higher entity emerging in the development of Christ, the state turns out to be capable of containing, encapsulating all the other, both civil society and families, civil societies and families into its own structure. Okay. Now, you said, or, or I said that we have to deal with the problem of the relationship between the individual and society. Now, since the highest entity or highest representation of the spread at this stage of reason turns out to be the state, highest incarnation of the spirit turns out to be the state, actually we should formulate, necessarily formulate our question as the problematic relationship between the individual and the state. Okay. Now, the complaint was this, okay? Hegel and following Hegel, Marx and perhaps some others were too ready to sacrifice individual freedoms to the benefit of the who? Benefit of the society, benefit of the state. Okay? However, it appears that if you read through the pages of uh, the phenomenology of spirit, you'll find out that Actually, such a complaint or such a formulation of the problem turns out to be irrelevant for Hegelian discussion. Okay? Simply because within the Hegelian logic, there is no way for an individual to come to oppose itself against society and against the state. Simply because, as I a little bit pointed out earlier, okay, the very possibility of the rise of the individual Okay, is dependent upon the existence of the society. Okay, no society, no individual. Okay, so the very formation of the individual, or if you like, the constitution of the individual, owes it is form, it is content, or whatever it is what. Okay, to the dynamics of the society as well. Okay. And since the state here at the latest stage of reason emerging as the highest incarnation of the Geist, there is no way that the individual can come to oppose him or herself against the state. Okay? It would turn out to be nothing else than a kind of, in the Hegelian terminology and discussion, kind of committing suicide. Okay? and of individuality, actually, while trying to protect one's individuality against state interference, for instance, okay, freedoms, uniqueness of our individuality, etc., all peculiarities of which we tend to think that they all belong to our own unique uh, God or uh, nature-given selfhood. Okay? Yeah, I am a unique individual, different from you, okay? I have these eccentricities, these good habits and those bad habits making me all different, you know? Even carrying that watch on my arm makes me unique, you know, in our industrial age. Strange enough, all those industrial mass-produced products making us unique to ourselves, but no, not to anybody else, strange enough, okay? So, our uniqueness, Hegel is showing us that our uniqueness, individual uniqueness, or what we refer as our individual freedoms, are nothing else than the product of the relations within society, okay? And therefore, one cannot talk, independent of these relationships, one cannot talk about one's own uniqueness or one's own freedoms, etc., okay? So, in that sense, it is in that sense, it comes impossible for Hegel to, that an individual contradicts against the society, contradicts with the society, and struggles against the state. Okay. This question seems to be quite out of place in Hegelian discussion. 
So what's the importance of this? With this, with the development of reason for the first time, okay, Geist folds upon its own self. This is a very crucial moment actually in the development of uh, the spirit simply because and representing the rise of the Hegelian philosophy as well in the fields of knowledge. Now the strange point was that up until now you may think that I was talking about the Hegelian philosophy. No, I was not. Okay? What I was talking was simply the pathway which Hegel did follow to be able to develop his own philosophy. Okay? Don't forget the title of the book was the phenomenology of the spirit. Of spirit, so translated. It is not the knowledge of spirit. It is the phenomenology of spirit, or it is the path to be able to discover how the knowledge of the spirit can be acquired. Okay. Now, Hegel shows how the dialectic relationships operate within the development of the spirit, splitting the spirit and therefore causing its own self-alienation. You know, uh, when we stuck at that stage, therefore, we will continuously talk about alienation within this terminology. When we stuck in a master-slave dialectic without arriving at the society with its reason, so to speak, okay, a society awaiting at a post-secular age, so to speak, okay, we will stuck in the master-slave dialectic, which means that all viewpoints developed would not be capable of representing the truth of the totality of the spirit, okay. And worse still, it means also that the spirit cannot know its own truth as well. So therefore, the Hegelian it is the task of the Hegelian philosophy to push for forward the way up until the spirit finds its own unity in its own self. Okay? For instance, this will have a great impact uh, in the interpretation of human knowledge in the development of universities as well. Uh, just as a uh, rather early reminder, uh, let me say this, okay, our modern conceptualization of university has been modeled after a university established in Berlin called the Berlin University at the beginning of the uh, when 19th century, 19th, 20th century, 1918 or so, okay, 20th century. Fine, the Black Berlin University was considered as the model for the modern university. Or you can call it uh, Humboldt University as well, okay? Because it has been established by the Prussian government when uh, Fred Friedrich Wilhelm Humboldt was uh, the Minister of Education. He was a linguist and uh, education uh, and uh, scholar of education as well. Okay, I'm following the German tradition, being under the impact of Fichte Hegel, but especially another Protestant thinker, Schleiermacher, okay, established the principles of the modern university. Now that modern university aimed at, aimed at arriving the unity of knowledge within the unity of spirit. Okay? Now, as you can see, the basic principle was this, okay? Spirit can only come to understand its own truth when it has developed enough to be able to see in its own totality. Okay? So what is at matter at stake in relation to the question of knowledge now? We are being it's it's we are being it's this the processes actually soldiers, so to speak, we scholars, we members of the faculty, being the soldiers of this process, functionaries of this process, okay? 
actually spritz knowing of its own self. Okay. So it is not the individual human being according to this framework who knows, who claims to know. Okay? It is the collectivity of the spirit by looking at its own self comes to know itself. Okay? We are being functionaries, simple functionaries, only express spirit's knowledge to spirit itself again. Okay? So it is not me, my own person speaking now a scientist would be able to say, okay? But the truth speaks, okay? <coughs> so, on the societal part, however, what takes place, especially within uh, this structure of family and civil society, <laughs> primarily in civil society, Okay, this is utmost, having utmost importance, is ethical life. Now, ethical life is a difficult concept. What's ethics, by the way? Kelimten. <laughs> What's ethics? Is there anybody? You know, you may heard of the term a lot, many times. Business ethics, academic ethics, occupational ethics, ethics of this, ethics of that. What do you understand by the term? What did you understand when I tell you ethical life? Is it the same with morality, for instance? What's the difference? If we translate ethics into Turkish, what word would you pick? Huh? Okay, let's try to translate ethics, the word ethics into Turkish. What word? Ahlak. Any other proposition? It's usually translated as ahlak in great Turkish dictionary uh, by TDK, Türk Dil Kurumu. It has been given as ahlak. Any other suggestion? Bilmem, I don't know. Erdemlilik. Erdemlik usually taken as the translation of virtues. Okay, but it can be as well. Ahlak. Erdemlilik. Any other suggestion? Ahlak. Work ethics. Çalışma ahlak. Ahlak. We translate as ahlak. İkinize de söyleyin. Kim orada? Kuralları takip et. Word, word, translation. I want translation, not definition. Definition, not, not definition. I want translation. You should say this word would be proper to use in Turkish instead of uh, this foreign term ethics. Okay, kuralları takip etme, sen yaşam felsefesi. Okay, it's none of these, at least in Hegel interpretation. We will see it after the break. Stay with us.